Money is one of the most ingenious inventions of mankind. Most people would like to have more, because we can exchange money for almost everything. Money is good for economic growth and enables us to make useful investments. Imagine for a moment a generous investor offering you two options. Either you'd receive 10,000 euros every week for a whole year, or you'd get one cent in the first week, which doubles every week over the course of an entire year, that is, for 52 weeks. Which would you choose? The first calculation is easy. At the end of the year, you would have 520,000 euros. But what is the end result of the second option? In the second week, you'd have two cents. In the third, four cents. And in the fourth week, eight cents. In the eighth week, you'd have one euro, 28 cents. While the first option already adds up to 80,000 euros. But after the 21st week, you'd have 10,000 euros, just as with the first offer. And after 26 weeks, you would surpass the sum of the first offer. Only a week later, it would already be twice as much. So, how much would that one cent have grown after 52 weeks? In week 52, you'd be the richest person in the world, with 22 trillion euros to your name. That is 10 times more than Germany's gross domestic product of about 2.5 trillion euros. Exponential growth is very difficult for us to imagine. We have experience with natural growth. At first it develops quickly, then slows down and eventually stops. We also understand linear growth. In that case, the economy grows by equal, absolute amounts. Money is covered by economic performance, measured as gross domestic product. But financial assets grow faster than the real economy. One reason for this is interest payments and the reinvestment of these gains, the so-called compound interest effect. At an interest rate of 3.5%, all financial assets double every 20 years, at 7% every 10 years. For example, growth in Germany began in 1948 with the introduction of the D-Mark. Financial assets have since grown exponentially. The money is no longer underpinned through real productive capacity. After 60 years in 2008, a crash occurs. The flaw is hidden right in the system. The next crisis is inevitable. But how does interest get paid? Most people believe that only those who take out a loan from a bank pay interest. They don't realize that the interest any producer of goods pays to the bank, for example on loans for the purchase of machinery, is always calculated into the price of the product. In this way, interest is contained in every calculation and is part of every price, even in the price we pay for milk, bread, and eggs. On average, the price of drinking and wastewater includes 15% interest. Rents, in most cases, include more than 50% cost of capital. On average, at least 30% of all expenditures goes towards interest payments. But who profits from interest? Anybody who saves or invests money receives interest, or to be more specific, a premium for foregoing their liquidity. These interest payments reflect the operating costs of the bank, an adjustment for inflation, a risk premium, and an incentive for the savings account holders for making their money available. Every investor is happy about earning interest. If the interest earned is higher than his expenses for interest, he has made money. But what about expenses through the hidden interest costs? Let's look at the German population grouped into 10 equal parts. 80% pay more interest than what they earn through investments, savings or insurances. 
For another 10%, interest payments and earnings even out. No more than 10% actually make a profit. If we just look at the difference, we realize how the middle class bears most of the interest payments. Only the richest 10% of the population benefit. They receive about 60% of all interest payments, passive income that is not the result of work. The monetary system leads to systematic redistribution from the majority of the population to the wealthy minority. The major share of the interest burden is carried by the middle class. And banks profit from everybody's debt. Their goal is to use money to make more money. In 2011, the total value of all goods and services worldwide was 70 trillion US dollars. But the stock market had an additional turnover of 63 trillion, the derivative market approximately 708 trillion, and the currency market 1,007 trillion dollars. The financial markets are many times larger than their basis, which is the world's gross domestic product. Further consequences of the flaw in our monetary system are inflation continually growing debt, and the unrelenting drive for growth. Our monetary system, of course, is not based on natural laws, but has been invented by human beings. Therefore, we can also redesign our monetary system, without compound interest and the need for continual growth, and without the redistribution of money in favor of the wealthy. The important question remains, can this be achieved? And if so, how?